Hello, friends. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today here at The New Creation. I am your friend, your brother in Christ, and your host for this channel. And my name is Jordan Oric. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to be sharing what we're uh, doing here. Um, trying to think, I've just got several things going on here. So excited. Um, for one, as I've mentioned, just got my acceptance letter uh, for Global Awakening Theological Seminary. Um, a fully, uh, just a great, you know, a great school. I'm looking forward to joining and earning my doctorate through. Um, so got that news yesterday. And then um, other projects and things that we have going on. Uh, as I've mentioned several times, my wife has, um, sorry, uh, my wife and I are working on getting um, some gear up, you know, some merch and some things like that from the New Creation channel here. We're going to do, you know, we're going to have uh, giveaways and then we're going to have, you know, stuff for sale as well. So anyways, somebody was calling me right when I was starting there. So looking forward to those things. But once again, thank you for joining me here. Uh, so excited to be studying and sharing God's word with people. Uh, people such as yourself. And we've been teaching, this is the fourth video we're, we're doing here on the book of Revelation and what I'm calling understanding the book of Revelation. And we've been laying a, a foundation and a framework, and we're really just getting ready to jump into it and, uh, you know, I don't know, dissect, <laughs> investigate, you know, really look into the book of Revelation and and lay some things out there that are going to help people have a grasp on this incredible, wonderful uh, book in the Holy Scripture, okay? So I just got a phone call the second I started, and uh, the guy outside the, the outside here uh, just went by with his lawnmower. So perfect timing, you know? Praise the Lord. All right. Um, but today, I want to look at an important issue. And we're going to deal with, um, well, let me get this pulled up here, the right thing. That's not what I need. Uh, we're going to be looking at understanding, as again, these are called the book of Revelation. And should we interpret uh, more literal or more symbolic? All right. That's a, that's a point of discussion in these debates surrounding how we, you know, eschatology and how we should understand it. Now, the dispensational camp the rapture, the all that, the futurist uh, dispensationalist camp. I hope that lawnmower is not too loud coming through here. I, I have no idea if it is, but hopefully it's not. It shouldn't last too long anyways. Um, the dispensational view prides itself on interpreting scripture, particularly eschatological scripture, uh, literally you know, literally in a wooden literalism. Now that's a phrase that I'll be using. That's a phrase that's commonly used. A wooden literalism, a crass wooden liter, just a, you know, absolute literal, what it says, right? Um, I have found that that's just very inconsistent. Now the preterist group or other groups who aren't literalist, futurist, dispensationalist get accused and, you know, uh, of, you know, well, you just, in, you guys interpret things spiritually, you know, as if that's bad or something, I guess. Uh, but they, that's an, it's said in a negative connotation as if somehow literal is better than a spiritual, symbolic, metaphorical meaning. Sometimes it is, but there's nothing, there's no Jesus, you know, we've got the Bible. Jesus didn't give us a handbook on, you know, uh, a little addendum to accompany the Bible that says stuff like you must interpret all of scripture in a literal sense. A lot of people don't understand this, but the fundamentalist movement and a lot of the evangelical movement that started clinging to and advocating this uber literalism in interpreting scripture, you know, creation, it's got to be six 24 hour literal days and stuff like that, you know, fighting these battles over these things. That's really 
Um, they don't understand that, but it's really, it came about because of the modernist enlightenment movement, the church for, you know, the early church, it was, it just, of course you interpreted scripture with metaphor and allegory and in non-literal ways at times, like, duh, like that was the obvious, obvious idea. It's very Western and modern, um, to say otherwise. So some people say you should interpret scripture literally unless it clearly indicates or tells you otherwise. And usually they're talking about revelation or eschatology or something like that. I would say you should interpret scripture literally just when you're supposed to, not just all the time, unless there's a clear, obvious sign, which that's subjective and who's it clear to and who's it not clear to, you know. So I want to show you from scripture, from the book of Revelation, how we should interpret Revelation, um, because it tells us. Now, again, the dispensational, our dispensational friends claim to interpret es eschatology literally, but yet again, I'll remind you of some powerful scriptures. Uh, I don't have them up here, but for example, Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. Jesus tells them, truly I say to you, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming, glory of his Father, with the holy angels, to judge man, men, according to their works. So that's, we're going to take that literally, because that's what Jesus said, that some of the people standing there would not die until he came in glory and judgment upon mankind. What about Matthew 24, 34, where Jesus says, truly I say to you, where Jesus says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Another scripture, Acts chapter 24 Verse 15, where the Apostle Paul says, most of your English translations won't interpret it correctly because it doesn't fit their theology. It says there will be a resurrection of the dead. But what Paul actually said in the Greek was there is about, Acts 24, 15, Paul said, there is about to be a rising again of the dead, the righteous and the wicked. Paul said that it was about to happen at that time. So are we going to take that literally or are you going to spiritualize it and explain it away like we get accused of, you know? Revelation 1, which we're going to start there, by the way, as we're investigating this literal or symbolic. It doesn't have to be either or. Sometimes it can be both and. I, much, I think that's much more, you know, two things can be true at the same time. I think this black and white, either or, this way or that way thing, just in general, is not the best way to approach a lot of things, but... Anyways, um, check this out. Here we go. Revelation 1, the, the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So let's take that literal. If we're going to interpret eschatology literally, then let's take that literally. He said 2,000 years ago, this was about to take place. All right. Then, but here's what I, and then in verse three, as we know, he says, these things were near and at hand, all right, for the time is near. Now, here's what I want to look at, though, if I could fix my cup, voila. Notice here in verse one, it says, and he sent and signified, now you see the word signified there has the word sign, so he signified the apocalypse, the vision, that is the book of Revelation, or visions, however you want to put it, to John. So Revelation 1, 1 tells us from the beginning these, these important factors. It's a revelation or an unveiling of Jesus, not the end of the world, not the Antichrist, not whatever. It's about Jesus. And it was a, the events of the apocalypse were about to take place, not 2,000 or more years in the future, and he showed these things to John in signs, or I'm going to put it this way, signs and symbols, 
All right. Signs, symbolism. All right. Now, um, let's see here. Let me get, uh, yeah. Now, to signify, the word signify or signify there, in, in the Greek, it's just simple. All it means is to make something known by a sign or signs, all right? So think of a stop sign. A stop sign is a word image, if you will, uh, I guess, that points to something outside of itself, beyond itself. Another re So it's just a, a stop sign, just some metal and paint, basically but it's signifying something to you. The book of Revelation has signs all over it, and it was showing something to its intended audience, which, by the way, John did not write the letter of the Apocalypse of Jesus to the Church of America in the year 2022. He wrote the book of Revelation to the seven churches, and we're going to be dealing with that very soon, perhaps in the next video. I'm going to... Uh, start teaching on the seven churches. And that's so important. You can't skip chapters one through three and then expect to have a proper interpretive grid, you know, for the rest of the book. It's, it's silly. It would be like having a letter from your whatever, whoever, great, great grandmother, or I don't know, somebody. And, you know, it's a five page letter. And yet you start, you know, on page four, like you wouldn't have the full context, the full understanding, right? Plus, if it was your grandmother and your culture and your family and your ways of doing things and, and that type of thing or, you know, whatever, there would be language and statements and idioms and things like that uh, that would speak to your family in certain ways that may not mean the same thing to me. Well, the book of Revelation, again, is essentially a plagiarism of various places in the Old Testament, mostly Ezekiel, Isaiah, probably Jeremiah, but um, lots of stuff from the Old Testament. It's just a, it's an inspired plagiarism, if you will, you know. So we want to be familiar with the fact that Revelation is not, again, in these indecipherable codes and symbols that, you know, nobody can really understand. It's written in a, in culture and language and ideas and idioms and figures of speech and pictures and signs and symbols and metaphors and allegories that made sense to the audience. And it was based upon, so take it from a smaller family context to a broader cultural context, uh, like with you and your great, great grandmother and the letter to you, well, let's, you know, just draw that out to a bigger picture. This John and his audience had an understanding of the Old Testament scriptures, all right, that all too often we're not as familiar with, and myself included, as perhaps we could, would, should be, need to be, okay? Um, so that's the language they're speaking. They're speaking Old Covenant, Hebrew scripture, apocalyptic language, all right? Now, um, these, these images in the book are, and that's what they are. They're signs, they're symbols, they're metaphor, they're allegory, they're prophetic pictures. They're pointing to spiritual realities here in the real world, of course. Um, and well, well, let me, here we go. Um, these signs and symbols Again, if we over-literalize them, we're missing the point. And, and think with me here. I mean, that's really why we have, that's one reason why we have so much confusion and disagreement on Revelation. All right? If we would stop imp superimposing a modern Western literalist idea onto the text in very subjective ways... And understand it's from the Hebrew scriptures, and it made sense to its intended audience because of that. Hence, it can make sense to us. All right. Now, I want to show you just several examples from the book of Revelation today on how it is to clearly be understood symbolically. So we're going to skip around some. I'm going to try to go in some kind of an order here. 
in order. But we're going to start in Revelation 1, verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to seven the, the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and I turned and I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, we're not going to read all of these scriptures in here, but just there. Here's Jesus talking to him. In one place, he says it's like the voice of many running waters, and then it's like the sound of a trumpet. So he hears a voice talking to him, and he turns around, and he sees the seven, the, the menorah, the seven golden lampstands. Is Jesus a, a seven golden lampstand? You know, is he a men, the menorah in the temple? Is that G, what Jesus is? Of course not. Sim, symbolism. The Lord is communicating through these pictures, through these signs, through these symbols, the trumpet. All these things have, you know, meaning in, in the lampstand. Now look here, verse 16. He says, and in his right hand, he held seven stars. So John sees Jesus and we didn't, you know, all the glory that he saw him in. And he's holding seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now we see from different places in scripture that this two-edged sword is the word of God. All right. So that two-edged sword points to God's word, God's truth, right? says, and his face was shining like the sun in its strength. And then jump down to verse 19 and 20. It says, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things in their lifetime, in other words. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches and oh, of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right. Now, so Jesus tells us clearly here. Uh, let me make sure I get it right here. The. How's he, uh, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So from the very beginning, Jesus, when he starts communicating the revelation, the apocalypse to John, from the get-go, he's using symbolism. John, here's these lampstands, here's these stars. They are these churches and these messengers. This voice of a trumpet, this sharp two-edged sword, this is the declaration, this is God's word going forth, all right? This is picture and symbology. Now, what I'm not going to do right now is deal with the seven churches because I'm going to do that in the upcoming videos and the, the cultural context and things related to them. So... We are going to skip over, you know, there's symbolism uh, used. In other words, there's symbolism used with them as well. But we're going to skip that for now because I just want to focus on those kind of in their own thing. But uh, Revelation chapter 5, I want to look at uh, verses 1 through maybe 6. And then uh, I'll try to be not too long here, as quick as I can be. So it says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book this, and to break the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book, the scroll, or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. 
And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So notice here. John is told here, stop weeping. Why? Because the lion is worthy to open the book because he overcame. Well, okay, we're supposed to interpret Revelation literally. So, okay, Jesus is a lion. If we're going to be consistent, if we're going to say it has to be literal, I'm just saying this we're it's really the opposite in the book of Revelation. As Revelation 1.1 says, you're, you're, it's communicated through prophetic signs and symbols. That's how we're supposed to understand it, unless we have good reason to then look at it literally. Now, symbolically, you know, symbolism and metaphor doesn't mean, you know, uh, that, how do you put that? That, it, that the... What it signifies isn't literal. Jesus obviously isn't literally a lion. But calling him the lion, this conquering lion, does metaphorically, prophetically communicate something that is literal. He is the king who overcame the greatest enemy. He is the king of kings, king of the jungle, king of the city, king of everything, baby, whatever you got. That's what it's communicating. All right. Now, so I do think it's interesting, though. This is so cool how he sees he's told Jesus is the lion. And then look at what he sees. Verse six. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns. Uh, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And remember when you see the word earth in, in some of these uh, scriptures, these verses today, that's the Greek word gay. It means a particular area, a fixed location with fixed borders. So it's talking about the land of Israel. All right. It's used that way throughout scripture in the New Testament. Um, throughout all the earth, that it, the earth that is the land of Israel, Palestine. So he's told, you know, the lion overcame. Now, this is beautiful, though. How did this, how did he overcome? By becoming a lamb who was slain. Now, here, too, Jesus is called a lamb. Well, is Jesus a furry little barn animal? Of course not. But it's communicating something to us. And that is how, that is obviously how we should understand the book of Revelation. Okay. Now, jump over to Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 12, and just, just look at verses 12 through 14. It says, I look when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became black like blood. So did the sun actually become black or made of hair? Was the moon some, somehow turned into blood? Of course not. Now, I want you to keep in mind, in the New Testament, well, well, throughout Scripture, but a lot of places in the New Testament, you have this reference to the sun, moon, and stars. Unfortunately, in dispensationals literalist approach, as I'm kicking something around, sorry, um, you know, they read these verses about the moon turned to blood and all, and they, they'll take, like, even in verses where it says together, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars fell to the earth, they'll take one part, they'll say like, well, the sun or the moon, you know, that's just a lunar eclipse, a so-called blood moon, but the stars falling, that's literal. So it's just at your own discretion, pick and choose at any moment what's what, what, you know, it's just untenable. So I'm not trying to be overly sarcastic, which I struggle with. I'm not, I'm trying to not be overly sarcastic or be a jerk or anything like that. That's not my heart. I love God's people. I love all of my, you know, dispensationalists. I'm just, you know, everybody, I'm just saying, I believe, you know, sometimes we have to point out 
things that are erroneous that keep people in bondage. All right. So the moon, you know, sun, moon and stars. Well, where's our reference to that in scripture? Well, you can go look in the book of Genesis. Joseph had a dream about his mother or his father, his mother and his siblings. And in the dream, his dad, who is his dad? Israel. His dad was the sun, his mother was the moon, and his brother brothers were the stars. Sun, moon, and stars in scripture means, unless, you know, not always, but very often it means Israel. It's just referring to old covenant Israel. All right. So, you know, when different scriptures communicate in different ways, the, this sun, moon, and stars, it, it's saying, you know, it was, you know, lights out for Israel. They're, they care, they were stewards of the light of God's revelation in the earth to the nations, to the Gentiles. But their light was being put out because it was a type and shadow. The true light himself had come, right? You understand? So it's saying, it's a way of saying lights out for Israel. And there's different ways you can understand it. Like the sun became black. Well, when Rome came in and starts burning and murdering and plundering and pillaging and, you know, there, there's the massive amounts of smoke, for example. I mean, just the fact that the temple itself was burned down, the massive amount of smoke going up into the sky, that happens in places in today or today's world. Even a couple of years ago in, 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 in uh, Europe, you know, there was a volcano and it was affecting the, the weather and the sun and the clouding, you know, it just that type of thing, all right? And so the moon becomes like blood. And so there's, you know, different reasons, you know, it can be kind of communicating these things. But just like the scripture talks about Israel being a fig tree and other things, it also talks about Israel as the sun, moon, and stars. That's all he's communicating here, okay? It's not a weather forecast or whatever. Uh, he says, now think about this. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Well, bless God, that, that's going to happen. That's literal. Well, if one star fell to the earth, the earth would be ended. We'd all be dumb and out of here. Goodbye, period, the end. See you in heaven. That'd be it. And yet there's other places here in Revelation. First of all, there wouldn't be any more of Revelation. It would just say, you know, the end, see you in heaven, more or less, you know. But there's several more chapters. So it's a prophetic point. It's a symbolic metaphor that Israel's covenant right with Yahweh was collapsing. Their world was coming undone. Okay? The world that was Old Covenant Israel was being undone. And you see throughout the book of Revelation, that's what you're seeing. This, this cataclysmic collapse of covenantal Israel described in incredible, uh, I don't even know how to, just phenomenal, uh, you know, descriptions. All right. So he says here, as a fig tree. So he's telling you, he's he's connecting sun, moon, and stars to the fig tree. This is shouting, this is Israel, this is the apostate Jewish people, all right? Cast its figs when shaken by a, a great wind, verse 14. The sky was split apart. Like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right? Again, if, if every mountain and every island on the planet started shifting and moving, I mean, I can't imagine the type of worldwide tsunami or super tsunami that it would happen. And again, I'm sure it would just be utter death, period. Like, clearly, obviously, this is metaphor. And that's okay. That doesn't make it less real. All right? Not literal doesn't mean not real. Oh, that's spiritual. Spiritual isn't physical. But that doesn't mean spiritual isn't real. It's just another aspect or type or another aspect of reality, another dimension, if you will, of reality, okay? Revelation 7, uh, verses 1 through 3. And I saw another angel ascending. And hopefully as we're doing this, you can take these thoughts 
and you realize that Revelation's about the destruction of Jerusalem, and you can start reading and, and studying and seeing these things for yourself in light of that. It's, it's wonderful. Again, eschatology makes sense. All right. Um, says, I saw another angel uh, ascending from the rising of the sun, ha having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice uh, to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the, the earth or the land, the land of Israel and the sea. Now, this, by the way, comes from the book of Ezekiel. But look at verse three saying, do not harm the land, the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed, this is all from Ezekiel, the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now, I'll mention this again uh, momentarily, but notice there's a seal on their foreheads. Well, what does that mean? We talk about the mark of the beast, and for some reason, that has to be a, a chip or something. You know, a few years, it's, I know every day there's a new theory. A few years ago with Obamacare, when that was being formulated and, and they talked about, you know, having your, your medical information in a thing, um, that's it. That's it. It's the mark of the beast. They're going to do it. Da -da -da. Smartphones, you know, oh, that's it, boy. That's the smartphones. That's, we're all connected and they're going to control us and you can't buy or sell without it. And they're going to, whatever. It's, it, you know, it it is bizarre to me that Christians have been indoctrinated to fear technology and technological advancements. A friend of mine uh, said that the Lord spoke to him years ago and told him that he tried, the Lord tried to give uh, whatever, the smartphone kind of idea, I think it was, to uh, different Christians, but they couldn't or wouldn't accept it. They couldn't receive it because it didn't fit their paradigm. Because the more technology advances, supposedly, the closer we are to the end. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing, Christians, if if pe some godly people had the money of Apple or Google or Amazon? Wouldn't that be a good thing? But instead, we we spurn it and fear it and push it off and and then point it point. You know, we'll buy it, so we think it's the devil, but we'll buy it when it could be one of us that's being bought from and. You know, it's just, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. You know what I'm saying, I think. Um, but notice here, is this seal, is that literal? If the mark of the beast has to be literal, can't these other things, don't they have to be literal? Okay, so we're going to have a seal on our head, okay. Now, look at Revelation chapter 8. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and of the moon and a third of the stars were struck. A third of the a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars would be struck so that a third of them would be darkened and would not shine for a third of it and in the night the same way. So I guess the literal interpretation is that the Lord, you know, somehow, uh, I don't know if he's going to, you know, flick it, hit it, whatever God, you know, want to do to make that happen. But like turn the lights off, like the two sides of the sun. If you, if you divided it into threes or the moon, either one, like, you know, the left side is lit up. The right side's lit up, but the middle of it's just pitch black. Is that what he's doing? Is that what it's saying? And same thing with the moon. And then, you know, one star or stars, rather stars already fell to the earth which would have, in chapter 6, which would have destroyed everything on planet Earth, period, the end. And so, and yet, now there's still stuff going on, but now a third of the stars, the Lord's doing something with them. No, he's talking about Israel. Whenever the Romans came in, in their invasion, in the first century, all right, a third of them, you know, in this, he's talking about Israel, as he does in other places here, like we read in chapter 6, sun, moon, and stars just like the fig tree, that's Israel. Moving on, try to be as quick as I can here. Revelation chapter 9, a couple of, a few verses here. It says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. So here's something else in one of these stars. Now, again, star, sun, moon, and stars often refers to Israel. 
And then there's other places in scripture where Jesus is the bright and morning star. Uh, there's different contexts for these things. Okay. So um, this star fell used in this context and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Now notice here, verse three. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth. Now I've heard, I think this is the one I've heard bizarre theories where people say the locust here, because people say, well, John didn't know how to describe futuristic events. And so he used the language as best he could. And, um, or better yet, John, when John talks about horses and chariots and swords and spears and things that were in the first century world, maybe that's what he was talking about because that's what he was talking about, you know? So the smoke of the locusts, uh, out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth or the land of Israel. Power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. Verse 7, the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. So John is telling you what's happening here. He's There's an explanation here. The prophetic symbol was the, the, the prophetic symbol that signified what these locusts, as it were, would be doing to people in the earth, in the land of Israel. He, he, see, power as scorpions. Well, what, what's, you know, for lack of, to, to inflict pain, torment. So the appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. Yes, because that's what the Romans were riding when they came in to Israel, to Jerusalem. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Hello, that's the Romans who came in to oppress, to kill, to wipe out the Jewish people at that time. Now, Revelation 10 says, I saw another strong angel. Now, the word angel means messenger. Another strong messenger coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. Hmm. Wonder who that might be. Revelation 1, verse 7, speaks of Jesus coming in these metaphoric prophetic clouds, his judgment coming. Clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow was upon his head. That's Jesus and his gospel of peace, his message of peace. All right. Upon his head, his face was like the sun. We know this from scripture, you know, other places. His feet like pillars of fire. So who's this strong angel, this messenger? I think it's quite clearly the Lord Jesus. Revelation 11. Let's look at a few verses here. It says, you know, we talk about the two witnesses. Well, look what he says. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Okay, well, if we're going to be literal, that's what they are. These two witnesses, they're not John the Baptist and Elijah or Moses or whoever else these these theories are. Uh, they're two olive trees and they're two lampstands because we've got to be literal, right? Well, of course not. They stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth. Now, people got these theories where Elijah and uh, who, who else, Enoch or John the Baptist or Moses, it kind of depends on who you ask, um, are going to be in Israel. And they're, this is, they're literally going to be out there preaching and fire is going to be killing people out of their mouth. Well, that's just not what it's saying. The Jeremiah, his word is shut up in my bones like fire or the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I mean, come on. This isn't literal. It's representing something. All right. If anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouths and devours their enemies. Now, I, I, th I think, well, we'll get to that moment. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Verse six, um, these have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth, the land of Israel, with every plague, plague so often as they desire. Now notice here, if if the, these two witnesses, I'm 
submitting to you are not too literal people. Now, again, this isn't in the future. This happened in the during the destruction of Jerusalem, the three and a half years from 66 to 70 AD, once the temple was destroyed. All right. So think with me here. Think Old Testament pictures and sim symbolism and, and that type of thing. Okay. I'm submitting that these so-called two witnesses are the law and the prophets. When throughout Israel's history, when they rebelled against Yahweh and judgment came and uh, other nations came in and Israel goes into captivity and, and all this type of thing, what was witnessing to them the whole time? The law, because they were rejecting the law of Yahweh, and the prophets that God would raise up and send to them. All right? Now, if anyone wants to harm them, fire. So this devouring fire, think of Elijah, who represents the, you know, think of Elijah, who represents the prophets and their fiery message, you know. Elijah, we know the story where the, you know, the, the, the people, Ahab, they keep, the soldiers keep coming to him and, you know, first two times fire devours them and think, you know, think of that. All right. Then they have the power to shut, so shut up the sky so it won't rain. Well, that's Elijah. So you have this Elijah that's the representing the prophets. Now, during the invasion of Israel, they, there were, there was fire people and things being burnt down, including most notably the temple. Right. Notice here though, you have the fire and the, and the not raining. So that, that represents Elijah's prophetic ministry. All right. And how long did it not rain when Elijah dealt with Ahab and his wickedness? For three and a half years. How long was the invasion? For, from the beginning of the invasion till the destruction of the temple? Three and a half years. The book of James talks about... Uh, the judge, Jesus, standing, he's the, he's already standing at the door. And then he points us to uh, Elijah and how it, it didn't rain three and a half years. The book of Revelation talks about this chapter, what is it, chapter chapter 11 or 12 here, this uh, three and a half year time of the Gentiles, okay? that The time of the Gentiles, that's when the Romans came into Jerusalem and desolated, you know, the abomination Gentiles in the temple, and then abomination of desolation, of destruction, okay? Hopefully this all makes sense. And then you think about, you know, who appeared to Jesus, Matthew 17, transfiguration, Moses, Elijah. All right, now it says, and power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the land with plagues. Well, that's Moses. So in other words, the law and the prophets were screaming out to the Jewish people, this is judgment you've brought upon yourself by rejecting the witness of the law and the prophets. Let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Your two witnesses here are, that comes from the Old Testament originally, the law and the prophets. Okay, now, hopefully that makes sense. Revelation 12. Oh, wait, actually, I have one more down here. I got to run it down. Um, or I thought I did. Maybe not. Um, I thought I had something else there that uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll see it somewhere. Okay. Revelation 12. Um, let's see here. Verse uh, starting in verse 2. It says, and she was with child, and she cried out. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, that's part of why I'm confused. Where's verse one? Okay, <laughs> it says, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman was clothed with the sun. Well, okay, so there's going to be a woman, if this is future and literal. We're going to see a woman in, in the sky or in heaven. It doesn't say the sky. So God's going to open a portal. And we're going to see into heaven, right? And there's going to be a woman standing there who's going to clothe herself with the sun. Now, remember, the sun already, you know, to one third of it can't show light anymore. Same thing with the moon. So she's going to be half lit up if we're taking all of this literal. And this must be a big woman. I, I mean, 
like mat, like unimaginably big because the sun, she can wear the sun as clothing and the moon. Wow. Under her feet and on her head, she's going to have a crown of 12 stars, 12 literal stars. You know, obviously stars wouldn't represent something else, you know, like the churches, like Jesus said in Revelation 1. All right, you get my point. So, and people debate, is this Mary or is this the church? I'm not dealing with that right now. Or, or, or some combination. Or anyways, she was with child and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven and behold, a great red dragon. So a great red dragon is apparently dragons are real. It's not metaphor. We've got to be literal. Uh, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, and on his heads were seven diadems. Crowns, you know. Uh, so Rome is the city on seven mountains or seven hills. And we know at this time that uh, Rome is the, was, how do I put it? The city on seven hills and then the ten horns, we know that Rome had ten different uh, sort of governors spread throughout who governing from their different positions. All right. So this makes sense to the people who are hearing this living in the Roman world under Roman oppression at that time. Verse four. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. So there's a dragon. And these stars are having a rough day. They're falling to the earth. Some of them are already uh, taken or whatever. Now we got another, we got a third of them being taken. All right. Unless it means something else. And this speaks of Satan's through the Roman Empire and the corrupt Jewish system persecuting. Uh, they, well, they were killing the Jewish people prior to that. The Romans and the Jews were persecuting the Christian people. But then once certain Jewish people tried to revolt against Rome, Rome came in and persecuted the Jewish people themselves. All right. So we have all of this in here. It says, and the dragon, or, or it says a third of the stars and threw them to the earth. Okay. Death, I believe, uh, to the land. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth So that, there we go, when she might give birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, who would this be? Who's supposed, who's ruling the earth? Who's the king of the earth? King Jesus and whether you even say that's Mary and he was born through Mary, or whether it's covenantal Israel through whom the Messiah came, whatever, that's not my point. I'm just saying I think we can see that this is Jesus, okay? It says, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that when, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days or three and a half years, which is the one and only biblical three and a half year great tribulation. So here you have this woman, this, you know, again, different interpretive schemes. And I, I'm, I'm just saying that here I can, I believe we can see it's the, the, the church, the believing remnant of the Jewish people who believed on the Messiah. Jesus told them, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee into the mountains. And that's exactly what, she did. And so we see all of that here. Okay. Trying to be as quick as I can here. I'm taking much, a little bit longer than I wanted. Uh, let me wrap up here a little bit. Um, yeah, we'll do that. And the dragon, Revelation 13, 1, stood on the stand of the seashore. So if this is all literal, man, we got a, in its future, we've got a giant dragon coming. Um, then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Now you got to you got to think too though. Like when Jesus was was born um Herod through Satan being the motivating factor wanted to kill and devour. So you know there's so much symbolism in it all. Sometimes I think these things can speak to more than one thing, which is normal for scripture. 
All right. Um, I saw the dragon standing on the seashore. Then I saw the beast coming up out of the sea. You do have in Revelation the land beast and the sea beast, um, which I believe is Rome and the apostate Jewish people, the synagogue of Satan, Jesus called it, having 10, 10 horns, seven heads, and on his horn were uh, 10 di diadems and blasphemous, blasphemous names. Now look down the verse 8. It says this, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man. So first of all, it's as if John expected his audience to understand this. And I think it's also very possible when John wrote this and the letter was being sent out and distributed on the Roman road on the way to the seven churches. Um, on this, The Romans had created their own type of road system, not like ours, but they used stones, some you know large stones to create roadways throughout the empire. And the seven churches were, you know, you, you could go to one after the other, right? Uh, so if as these letters letters are being delivered, if you're stopped by Roman authorities, one thing I think would have happened is all the symbolism in the book, it was Jewish, not, you know, Roman, whatever. Uh, it wouldn't have been their culture. All right. So it wouldn't have made sense to them. Now, he says, uh, and here's something that's also almost universally missed. He says, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The Bible, John, does not say the mark of the beast, the number of the mark of the beast is 666. It is not 666. Three sixes. It is a numerical value of 666. Now, I'll deal with this later on, but the long and the short of it is, many scholars will tell you, you know, if you take... Uh, and this is really interesting. I probably shouldn't get too much into it. But if you take the name Nero Caesar, Nero Caesar, all right? And uh, you know how uh, Hebrew, uh, let's see here. Well, let's say the, the, the Roman numerals. Well, you have letters which represent a numeric value, right? So if you take Nero Caesar and you do his name, the new, each letter representing a certain value, the, like in English, the N for Nero has a certain value, then the E, Nero, or each letter, uh, the numerical value totaled for Nero Caesar is 600, you guessed it, 666, okay? We'll deal more with some of the details on that later because there are some manuscripts that have 616 and we're going to explain why it's not some, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's still Nero. Um, anyways, we'll deal more with that later. But I wanted you to see there that this this beast and, and all of this, what it represents. All right. It's not a literal dragon. It's not some animal coming out of the ocean. You know, um, as my friend Lynn Hiles says, it's not, bugs the size of Volkswagens. That's not the point. These are signs pointing to something or communicating something. I really want to wrap this up. Let me see if just one or two more here that, that uh, are a little more pertinent or stand out. Um, here we go. Yeah, Revelation 14. So we just saw the, the very end of Revelation 13, this number, this, excuse me, this numerical value of the mark of the beast, 666. Um, so people take that as super literal. But what about this other mark that we see? We've already seen some of it, but we see again here, this mark of the Father, Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, Woo! and with him 144,000, having his name. See, again, there are different groups that get all tore up on that 144,000. It has to be literal. It's not literal. It's just speaking that there was a remnant of the Jewish people in the first century who did believe in the Messiah. All right. So, um, and with him, 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. 
So the name of his father written on their foreheads. So in the future, if we're going to have people with chips in their hands or heads, then I guess the Christians who are around will have, I don't know, you know, is it going to say Abba written across their heads? Like a, like a tattoo that, you know, God put there himself. Come on. It's saying they 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 belong to Abba. All right. Clearly. Now, let me see if we can do any more here, because um, let me do one more. I, 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 I'm This is from uh, Revelation chapter 11. So jumping back a little. Notice this verse eight it says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street. The witnesses so-called of the great city. Which mystically because the law and the prophets died in 70 AD, if you will, uh, which is mystically or spiritually called, pay attention, Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Well, let me ask you, was Jesus crucified in Sodom? Was Jesus crucified in Egypt? No. What's he said? <laughs> Jerusalem had become so evil and so corrupt that it represented the pinnacle of evil and oppression, Sodom and Egypt. That's how corrupt they had become in the first century. That's how far they had drifted from Yahweh's truth, so much so that they rejected and murdered their own Messiah. Okay? So, we see a clear example here. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where Jesus was crucified. Well, he was crucified in Jerusalem. Okay? So you see the point that he's making there. That's not. That's nothing out of place for the book of Revelation. That's how the book as a whole functions. All right? Well, I have more, but we're going to stop there. That went lo much longer than I intended to. I don't know if you stuck around for all of it, but thank you for watching, you know, any of it. But if you did, thank you. And I, I just hope and pray that these, these teachings are coming together and making sense for you. And I tell you, the book of Revelation and biblical eschatology is so powerful, makes so much sense, so beautiful when we understand it in its own context without superimposing our own context. And part of that, as we've seen today, is not superimposing a modern Western hyper-literalism, wooden literalism onto the text, but interpreting Revelation the way that it tells us to, signs and symbols, metaphors, okay? So that's it for today. Um, I thank you again for joining me. If you enjoyed this video, I ask you to give it a thumbs up. It helps the channel greatly. Uh, we want to reach more people with this glorious good news. So much more stuff on the way um, that I want to get to, but one video, one thing at a time. And um, anyways, we do love you. We appreciate you. And we thank you for joining us. And I am Jordan Oreck. If you like the, and this is the new creation. Again, if you like the video, like it, subscribe to the channel and share the video if you like it. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. And hopefully I will see you next time. Thank you so much. And God bless you.